You're listening to Seamside, where we explore the inner work of textiles. I'm your host, Zach Foster, and in this part two of a very special Seamside documentary project, we talk about a recent commission that Amanda Nadig and I received to make a quilt out of a client's collection of high-end silk neckties. Hey, Seamsiders, you may have heard, but the Nook is turning two years old real soon. And so to celebrate, I'm giving away two annual memberships good for the entire year of 2024 to two people listening to the sound of my voice right now. I won't be sharing this giveaway anywhere else but here on Seamside, so seems to me your chances are pretty good you could win. To enter the giveaway, there's a link in the show notes below. Drop over there to get your name in the hat, and you have until December 31st. 2023. I'll draw the winners on January 1st, 2024, and the winners will get 12 months of quilty goodness. That's 12 different workshops hosted by visiting artists, 24 sewing circles hosted by me, along with countless other sewing circles hosted by other good folks on the Nook. Every day of the year, there's something happening over on the Nook. There's so much to love. I hope to see you there. I recently spent a week in Chicago with my good friend, Amanda Nadick, and since I'd recently bought a small handheld recorder, we thought it'd be fun to take you behind the scenes, day by day, as we're making this quilt, encountering creative obstacles when things aren't turning out our way, and how we navigate through this particular project together. In part one, Amanda and I shared details about this particular commission, the kind of prep work we did to get ready for our week of sewing side by side in Chicago. And we had an in-depth reflection on something that was becoming more and more fascinating to us. And that is the way that by working on a quilt with someone else, it forces us to create this kind of specialized language around the project. One you might not even articulate to yourself if you're working alone, but in the company of another artist, you find yourself having to put abstract ideas into words. So if you haven't heard that part of this documentary project yet, I encourage you to go back and listen to the previous episode and then join us here again for part two. In this part, Amanda and I strategize about quilting, how we choose an overall quilting design, the important relationship between light and color, the body as a measuring tool, and we close this conversation with reflections and tips that we hope support you in seeking out your own creative collaborations. Sunday, day four. One of the things I love most about spending time with Amanda in her home is that every corner sparks a new idea. It's like a creative playground in every room. This morning, we have a lazy start to the day, then have some quilt adventures with a button maker and a toy camera that belongs to her son, Rocky. I could have kept playing all day, but I have to head downtown to have brunch with Travis before he goes back to see his second opera in 24 hours. And here we pick up with Amanda and I touching base on what needs to be done before I go. So it's Sunday morning, and Amanda and I have snuck away for a few minutes, come upstairs to the kids' room, because downstairs, there's a lot of hubbub. There's a lot of fun this morning. What have we been up to this morning? Well, when I got up to make coffee, and I was really excited to come down the stairs and see our quilt in, in the daylight, because when we end for the evening, it just looks, the colors are really dark and dim, and so this is yeah, really fun. I've, I've started calling it sad light in my mind, sad which is, <laughs> Which is, I don't, I don't want that to get stuck in my brain because also like blue light, but it just, the quilt does look suppressed at the end of the day in the, yeah. in, in the evening light. Well, sometimes we try to make decisions late at night. We're like, wait, we need to revisit it in the morning because it's just so good. It's just, the colors are so good and we need to see them in for what, what they really are with the light. You need light to see color. Mm-hmm. So I came downstairs and I noticed a few things were moving. I'm like, oh, I wonder if Zach didn't go to bed the same time as me and made coffee and then I saw that you must have not slept as long as I did because you worked on it some more there's some more applique where we laid out that centerpiece where the two pieces joined together we laid that out and and tried a few variations and we got it exactly how we wanted and I thought that that was the next thing today. I'd be drinking coffee and starting to attach those that they're already attached. Da, da, da. <laughs> you did and it. so <laughs> we did start the morning slow. Mm-hmm. We didn't just jump into the quilt. We actually just like played around, had some fun. But it started with the thermal camera that Rocky has. So this little thermal camera is so great because it just takes this paper that just keeps printing out on this like scroll. So it's very basic, but it really simplifies everything to a gorgeous 
black and white and maybe one shade of gray. So it's just high contrast, black and white. So he started taking pictures of the quilt and us looking at the quilt. And it just looked so lovely. Just all the color was removed and you could see all the shapes we've been creating. And some of my favorite pictures that he took were the ones where he turned on the inverted color filter. Yeah. So the lights were now dark and the darks were now light. And it was just so dynamic. Oh, then we got the button maker. Zach saw I have a button maker. maker. I was just thinking some of those photos could go in the button maker as well. But Zach said, have you ever put fabric in the button maker? I'm like, no, that's a genius idea. Has anybody done that? Have you done that? Because I'm just like, once we got started, we couldn't stop. Yeah. So it was very like we laid scraps from this project and it just flat presses it and laminates it in the button maker. And they're just create gorgeous composition so so we were just playing around with things like that just admiring the quilt in its stage but knowing we needed to then we need to move forward with the basting we were deciding that we wanted another layer inside the quilts yeah because there was something as i was working last night i've never thought this before but there's something that just felt like it needed some more structure or support like it just felt too flimsy and i think it might be because the strips that we fuse together run the length of the entire quilt. And so maybe that makes it a little shiftier than I'm used to or something. It's a very long, narrow quilt. And it's going to hang on a wall. That's its only purpose. Right. right. So we, we tossed around a couple of ideas of how we could layer it, but we ended up with this one kind of type of batting I'd never heard of before. I had this batting from years ago when I was looking for something with a low loft. So we know we don't want the loft to be too high. And since we already have batting in there and it was, we did consider a flannel sheet. We we had one, but it was just way too thick. We want it to be really enjoyable to sew through these layers. (laughs) Yeah. My first first thought was burlap. I'm like, nah, that's not going to be (laughs) be fun. No, I want it to be lovely to sew through. So I happen to have this batting, but I know someone that recommended this batting to me that a lot of folks, when they make, quilted garments this is a popular like thin batting that has a lot of structure so we have that now cut into two pieces but we need to still add the backing the final backing layer of fabric and then we have to pin it down a lot yeah so i'm getting ready to go downtown with my partner we're going to go have some brunch because he's then going to go see his second opera in 24 (laughs) hours and uh, while i'm gone i hope that you'll get a chance to get your one half of the quilt basted and so you can start Mm -hmm. quilting yeah i'm really excited to start quilting we were talking about how are we going to quilt this because if we're going to keep switching it back and forth and we want to have it uniform and balanced on both sides we want that stitch language we want evenly distributed right right and your quilting lines will look different than mine because we're different people and we want to use a high contrast thread so what we're trying to do is reinforce these diagonal lines that we have that are slanting toward one another. So there are these parallel kind of diagonal lines and they ooze into each other. So they're not really clear to be seen, but they're there. So we're going to reinforce that and make the diagonal stronger and just stitch along in that direction, the diagonals. Yeah, because we really like the painterly look about how these strips of the scrolls that we made came together and kind of like ooze to say your word one onto the other but we don't want it to ooze so much that we lose the original strips and so i think we've done a number of things to try to keep that in place so the quilting lines will be one the black lines that you'll be able to see in this quilt reinforce that directionality as well Mm -hmm. yeah do you want to share a little bit about what we're thinking about how we're going to at least make a first pass at the quilting together Right. So if I were quilting this alone, I would start in the middle and right through the center without using a ruler, but just eyeballing the center point of of one of these strips. So I would go right up the center. However, then I would take my like two fingers or a thumb and I would just keep echoing that line. But because we want to be able to switch these two halves and have a mixture of our style of hand quilting, or we're going to start really wide apart. So I'll start with that first line, and then I will take like four fingers and do another parallel-ish line, and then another one that are four fingers apart. So wide lines. And then we'll switch. When you come back from going downtown, you'll have some maybe quilting on, on yours, and then we'll switch 
and then I'll start filling in between the lines that you already made with more hand quilting running stitches. I know we both have rulers in our studios somewhere, yeah. but I really love using the body as a measuring tool because then, one, it's just easier. But two, when you look at the finished quilt, your, your body is almost literally like represented in that object. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. Yeah, we're not too worried like, well, your two fingers might be a different width. We already know my two fingers will be wider than your two fingers because your thimble is smaller than my thimble. When <laughs> I, use, I use the green thimble and Amanda uses a purple yeah, thimble. Yeah, I use the bigger thimble. <laughs> so I'm like, are my fingers very? But it's just a rough measurement. I think we just didn't think twice. Like, oh, yeah, sometimes it'll be your two fingers width and other places it'll be my two fingers wide or my four fingers wide. But you always have your fingers with you. So it's just an easy measuring tool. And it's also a way to make sure every step of the process is integrated with all the other steps, right? Mm -hmm. Like we haven't been using rulers mm -mm. up until this point. So to do like really strict straight lines would feel it disjointed. It would look I out think. of place. It would yeah. definitely look out of place if we suddenly chose a quilting pattern that's not even represented in what's there. Mm -hmm. in the okay, so I'm going to go get some brunch. You're going to do a couple things. When I come back, your hat's already going to be all quilted, isn't it? Well, I don't know. I need to do... Some laundry and maybe clean a bathroom or not. Those are the decisions you have to make as a when you want to sew all day. What a I'll drag. Myself. What a drag. <laughs> the real life gets <laughs> yeah. in the way, right? Well, I hope you get a chance to relax and just enjoy yeah, your Sunday morning. I can't wait to sew the first row through this. The, we've been working pretty hard to get to this point because we are so, this is such a rewarding part of it, seeing it all come together. And we've got Sunday afternoon and evening, and then we have all day Monday, all day Tuesday. We're in a really comfortable, I'm really happy we're at this point. And if we weren't, it's fine because that's just part of the process. But we're, I'm just really excited how it came together to give us this time to really spend a lot of time hand quilting and not rush that process. Well, because one of the things I regretted or wish we could have done differently with the Maestra mm -hmm. collaboration was I finished that one up. Like you, I left it with you. Mm -hmm. You did a lot of the quilting. Then you sent mm -hmm. it to me and I put the backing on and mm -hmm. the binding. And so like we weren't able to celebrate the completion of the quilt together. And I'm really hopeful that this time we can and get that, get that good picture for Instagram and all that stuff. Yeah. So I think that's another reason you thought that we would start quilting really far apart is that in case we didn't finish together, we could take a picture of this quilt Maybe not with all the hand quilting in it, with just like wider apart lines. But I really feel at this point we're going to have this. We're going to finish the quilt. Because we're so excited about our binding. But we'll talk about that later. Ooh, save Give it for the... ideas for the binding that are like unexpected. That's right. Next segment. Yeah. Okay, y'all. I got to get to brunch. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Better. Monday, day five. It's the big quilting day today, so Amanda and I devise a strategy to make a quick overall pass at the quilting, sewing lines that are roughly four fingers apart. This has a couple of advantages. One, it allows us to secure all the layers of the quilt quickly so we can remove the safety pins that threads love to get stuck on. It also gives us guidelines for filling in the remaining quilting lines without having to measure each time. So what we do is we divide four finger rows into two finger rows and then eventually one finger rows. And in this segment, I suppose it's only natural that given all these hours of intensive quilting, that our hands and wrists start to get a little bit achy. So you'll hear us talk about a couple of things that we hope will keep us quilting right along pain-free. So it's Monday morning and we're sitting here on Amanda's couch with her oldest kid, Grant. And... We're looking at this quilt spread out on the floor. It's beautiful. We just had a pancake breakfast that Amanda fixed on the griddle with sausage and egg. And we're full and happy and ready to start thinking about the work ahead of us today. What did we do yesterday? Can you give us kind of a recap, Amanda? Yeah, so yesterday you headed downtown for a little while. I did some cleaning up around here, some laundry. But then I, I pieced a little bit more of some scraps because we have just enough to cover the back. And then basted it, pinned down loosely. Like not, the pins aren't super close together, about a hand width apart throughout both pieces. And Which is, then, I think, standard for most people. It seems like it. Hand, that's Sometimes what I, I think that I'm supposed to be doing it more than that. But for me, it works because I can adjust the pins and I can remove them and not feel overwhelmed with them. But then the first row, I sat outside. It was really beautiful. And then you joined me soon after. We were sitting outside, some warm sun hitting our face. And 
we just started by sewing a running stitch and then that determined kind of echoed the lines that's what we did and so that we did it across both halves until we could remove all the pins yeah and so last night we had all of our wide quilting done we were calling it right which is all the four finger rows were done which is wonderful because that first pass happened so quickly relatively speaking that we were able to take out all the pins so now as we go back to quilt in between the rows we're going to split each one down the middle to make two finger rows and then we're going to split each of those to make one finger rows but we get to do that with zero safety pins to like catch our threads or get in the way Something else we did do that we were able to do once we had that first wide quilting across the whole thing is that we laid it out and trimmed it a little bit. Like the we, silhouette. Yeah, yeah, the silhouette had a few areas that we patched up. So we've been saving scraps that we filled in certain areas to make it feel. Now I can't even tell where we did that. No, no. But well, what's funny is a lot of those patches came from other parts of the silhouette that were too high so we had to trim them off mm -hmm. and we just put just them in the redistributed yeah. them right so now it's more square ish so that as we get denser with the quilting we're not going to have to cut through any of those because we feel really great about the silhouette now exactly one thing i was noticing towards the end of the day yesterday is that my left wrist started getting buzzy here and there little moments of buzz in the carpal tunnel area and so mm -hmm. For me, I think, well, that's that's definitely an indication to take a good break. I basically stopped for the night. I might have done like a little bit of like applique stitching after that, but not any quilting stitching. Because I find that it always seems like it's the non-sewing hand that has to do the gripping of the quilt to manipulate it, that I must just be squeezing too hard or just applying too much pressure. And so I think of our good friend Heidi and Hand Yoga Club. I did some stretches that she's taught me about how to get those carpals looser and more limber. And... I took Advil to hopefully help with that this morning. I think we'll be ready to go. I hope so. I was able to do a little bit more stitching, but now I'm really feeling mine this morning. When I woke up, I felt achy in my hand, but it's also my non-dominant hand. It's something I noticed that I did this morning when I woke up, when I continued quilting. It's real quiet and dark in the house. I like to sometimes wake up really early. I noticed I did do what you did and flipped the whole quilt over and stitched with white thread on that black backing because it's so busy and it was so much easier to see that I was headed through the center of those quilting rows and it's neat to imagine how it's going to look but we have a lot of work to do today this yeah, is our did. last full day yeah. together so. and so our goal today is to get all the dense quilting done yes and hopefully start on the binding yes so yeah we'll, we'll our, our plans have changed we think from our original thought of the binding so we'll have to report back about our final and now my son just ran across the floor. <laughs> You're good. Everyone does that. We're used to it. The dog. Welcome to the Natick household. To, like, everyone knows that we stare at it. And if uh -huh. they get and if they stand around the quilt, we'll look at them too. So everyone gets attention. I like to think that the quilt <laughs> just has a natural magnetism. It does. It, does. <laughs> it is so vibrant. It's just. It, and it's going through all these phases. It just keeps getting better and better. It's pretty amazing. Four days. Yeah. Ago. This is just. This is just day five. Wow, yeah. Tuesday, day six, and really just a half day. I guess you always wish you had more time to spend with good friends, but Travis and I have to catch a flight to Atlanta to see family for Thanksgiving. So in this last morning, Amanda and I give you an update on how those wrist supports and hand yoga worked out, how we ended up binding the quilt, and then we wrap up things with a couple of really special reflections. It's important to both of us that we see ourselves represented in this collaboration. And sometimes that's easier done when you have a good friend mirror that back to you. So Amanda and I share what we see of one another in this project. We wrap up this last morning together with a few tips that have been really helpful for making our collaboration such positive experiences, with the hope that you too will seek out collaborations in your own creative practice. Okay, this is my last day in Chicago. <laughs> I'm sitting up in the kids' bedroom with Amanda because we had to squirrel away for a few minutes to get a quiet spot. And we're wrapping up this quilt project fast and furious. And we had just a couple more thoughts that we wanted to get down here in this audio diary, as we've been calling it. I think first, our hands, our poor hands. You want to talk about that, Amanda? Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to think back to last night. So we have quite a few layers in this quilt. So I think that's why we noticed. You and I are both used to quilting every day, but 
It was just particularly extra layers. And we were noticing, well, first you noticed your left wrist was bothering you. And then I was like, oh, yeah, my fingers are bothering me. It's higher up in my hand. This was yesterday morning. And so then we we got some... We didn't even have time to go drive to a store to pick out any type of compression, gloves, or wrist braces. So we ordered some. <laughs> and we have two different kinds. So we just wore those last night, up until last night, just sewing with these things in our hands. So the ones you got are kind of like fingerless compression gloves. They're pretty sleek and slender. And then mm. the one that really helped me the most was one that really kind of locked my wrist straight so I couldn't bend it. It goes mostly around the wrist, but it secures itself on the thumb. Right now, I'm doubling up on both. It's the fingerless glove compression with the wrist brace over <laughs> it. Even though it's not really my wrist, I just like the the compression feels nice. It feels and this, supportive. And right now, moving into this the day after that aching, I woke up feeling fine. My hands are really fine. But just knowing that we just have a little bit more quilting to do in the middle as we join the two. I'm just going to wear the compression and the wrist guard on on my left non-sewing hand. So. Yeah, I think that was a good trick because my wrist didn't bother me the rest of the day and I woke up feeling really good this morning. Also was helpful is we've both been doing stretches throughout the day that Heidi taught us from yes. Hand Yoga Club, yes. right? With stretching the carpals and things like that. So thank you, Heidi. Yeah, thanks. Now, thank let's look at this quilt for a minute. We finished quilting it. We got all of those rows down to one finger widths. And now this morning we've worked on bringing the two halves together. So now it's one complete quilt. Right. So it was applique on the front to join the two where all the all the pieces converge. So it's like this overlapping. And doing that on the floor was best because that's how we had it laid out last night. And then flipping the whole piece over and then just making it look really lovely where the two halves crossed on the back. So that's all pinned. And that's what I woke up to this morning. And I was like, oh, the Quilty Fairy's been at work. And it was such a treat. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I was I was stretching my whole body in these different positions on the floor as I was hand appliquing the front. It just felt really good. It's like nice to be in a different position than sitting on the couch yesterday. So I feel really, my body feels really good. I mean, quilting definitely is a whole body sport. Yeah, I definitely feel like I ran like a really long race all day yesterday. <laughs> I mean, like we've today. Pro- we've probably been working like, I don't know, 10 hours a day these last oh, five, yeah. six days. Yeah. And last yesterday was really just a heavy sit and quilt day. So Yeah, because we knew it was the last full day, mm-hmm. right? Now, oh, and then before we went to bed last night, we also bound oh, it. Yes. And so to bind it, we ended up just taking a bunch of ties that we hadn't cut into yet, cut them long ways down the middle, and then just... Fold them over the edge. So it's a sweet kind of, it's not a straight binding because a tie kind of is a wedge, right? And so the binding has these wedge moments where it pops up on certain points. But we like that reference. It it works really well, I think. We originally were going to fold the back to the front, but I'm so glad that you brought up like a patchwork of ties for the binding. Of course, that's wonderful. And then you also checked in with me, whip stitch on the binding to Mm -hmm. fold it over to the front or running stitch, and we both agreed we wanted a whip stitch. And why did we choose whip stitch, do you think? Just to have the pattern be more of the emphasis and not the the stitching on top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do feel like a whip stitch just blends things together in a way that a running stitch for me creates kind of a line and a definition, mm-hmm. and a whip stitch melds them, oozes them together to use our right. word. Right, and the the whip stitch is visible, which is mm-hmm. really lovely, the hand stitching of it, but it's it's not like we're trying to hide it. But what's really lovely besides all the patterns coming together between each tie is that one tie starts and the next tie begins on the binding. It does waver between thin and thick line mm-hmm. around the whole perimeter. It's really lovely. Yeah. I love that. And the magic really happens. I mean, to think that we almost brought that plain black fabric around for the border is now crazy because the magic for me is seeing how the various ties that we use in the binding now meet up with the ties on the front you get this jumble of patterns happening right around the edge which is really electric yeah it's like the pattern continues but it at the same time feels very finished on the edge Mm -hmm. it's great it's on a lot now one of the things we've been talking about with collaborations that's so exciting is that it's a chance for both artists to really like pour the best of themselves into a project. You end up with hopefully a project that's twice as good as it could have been if only one of us were working on this own. And so I'm curious, Amanda, when you look at this quilt, where do you see my hand at work? Because I know where I see your hand at work. One of the things that 
I'm really thankful for in this process, looking back on it, that I think you were really instrumental at is I'm, it's funny, I'm going to say I'm comfortable with like unstructured chaos, right? Which is funny because I, I don't <laughs> live my life that way. But like visually, I'm fine with just like a hodgepodge of collage. Ooh, hodgepodge of collage. Mm-hmm. I'm fine with that, like on a quilt. I don't need a resting place. I can just keep moving and that's fine with me. But early on, you said a couple different things that I think really informed the direction of this quilt. One, bringing more of that black into the quilt front so that we had those kind of calm and quiet moments that provide just this structure, this kind of skeleton for this whole thing to hang on, which I'm really glad that we did. And on a similar note, when we were sewing the scroll strips together Mm -hmm. and we had those overlapping flaps that need to be sewn down, you said, well, let's not just sew down all the flaps. Sometimes we should just create a straight line between these stripes just to really reinforce those stripes and not have it all organic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing I appreciate about what you've brought to this project is this, yes, it can be loose and it can be collagey, but let's also have a little bit of structure in in places. Yeah. And and something I was noticing about you watching you work is that you were just, I felt like the composition was finished, but then you just keep going. You're like grabbing patches of red and you're just, you really pay attention to the whole piece, which is something I think I've done in my own practice. But what you're noticing is like the balance of colors so that your eye jumps back and forth and you keep, you kept throwing down these large pieces, like even on top of areas that we already thought were resolved. Mm-hmm. It's like you kept pushing it and, and it just seemed really extra and great. It's like special attention to detail and like well, this this red over here needs to speak to this red over here. And so I think normally I'd be like, okay, well, sometimes enough is enough. But I trusted that you, like, I, I love your work and I worked with you and I, I trusted that it's going to come together. Some of those big red splotches that you're throwing on there mm. seemed maybe up close out of place, but I knew that you were really good at looking at the whole, stepping back a lot. Whereas sometimes I want to just keep going. Like, Zach, why do we need to stop and look at the... Can we just keep going? I can't <laughs> want to keep sewing. But those moments are really important, to, especially in such a large piece, that those, we do step away. Yeah, because those big red spots you're talking about are right in the center. Yeah, right? but they, they... They reinforce that upward movement of the quilt. But, you, but now they're just like, I can't imagine them not being there. Mm. But it's like, at the time, I needed to just trust... That what you were doing, like I knew, I knew it wasn't hard for me to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to see what he see. Like, I'm going to see your vision at some point. We're not going to see the same vision at the same time. Mm-mm. I'm so glad that those are there because they really are a beautiful moment. Well, I think that makes me think that one thing I would like to wrap up this conversation, Amanda, with you is for people that are interested in thinking about collaborations and finding a collaborative partner to work with. What are some of the things that you've experienced, work with me or other collaborations, that you feel like it's important to keep in mind? I mean, you just touched on one that I feel like is so key, which is you got to have an unbridled respect for the other person's work. Because otherwise, I feel like you're always going to be second guessing each other and it's going to be more of a tension and a struggle as opposed to an exercise in trust, like a trust fall. Mm-hmm. Definitely start with a trust fall. Into a quilt, maybe, in case. Yeah, big um, pile of quilts. Put a pile of quilts down before you do the trust fall, just in case that test doesn't work. I would say I have a tip on choosing someone to collaborate with. If I were to try to work with someone who would not be comfortable with me to just like move forward and chop a big chunk out of something that was already maybe took three hours to hand stitch, like you're okay with that because you know that like, That wasn't a waste of time to do all that hand stitching and then chop that right out. Like that could be really difficult for some folks. Like let's just leave it in because it took so much time to do. Mm. But I feel like, and also just like, obviously that could go back to like, are you someone that measures a lot? And is the other person someone who can just like lay their hand down and say, okay, this is enough. So I guess it's not perfectionism because I do think you and I are perfectionists, but we're not like perfectionists in the, we're perfectionists in the areas that are similar. Mm -hmm. We're (laughs) like, we want, I don't know. I don't know how to describe that. I think to say we're not perfectionists is wrong. 
No, we don't. We just both don't want to use vision. a ruler. We yeah, perfect, we have a... We want to perfect our vision. Yeah, we want to perfect our vision. And we're willing to work hard to make that happen. Yeah. And cut hunks us. out and start over. And Right, right. Mm-hmm. Starting over and taking a lot of stitches out. So I think what I really find joy in working with you is like, and you have to find this person that whatever it is that you enjoy about your process and part of my process is i love being able to just dive in and kind of experiment and that said i mean it could be really interesting to work with someone who had a very different process Mm. but i would think communication would be even more important in that situation yes yes just be like hey you know here's some of the ways we're different let's be aware of that going into the project and let's just keep talking through when we when we come to those areas where we need to talk things that's a really good point because one of the best parts of a collaboration is your creative partner approaching something very different from you. Without that, you're not learning and growing and your process isn't going to evolve. Because now my process is I have some quilts that I want to make that I would never have dreamed of after this because of some stuff that I learned that you do. Some things that you pay attention to that I don't usually pay attention to. So I really appreciate that. Like, I wouldn't have done some of this overlapping of these sheer fabrics. And now I'm, like, so excited about trying that. It's something I was trying to just skip over. But you said, no, we need to go back. And so those those moments are really great. Oh, this is what I wanted to say. <laughs> I was like, I know this is going somewhere. Yeah. But in saying that, when, when I give an idea and then you said, or the other way around, I don't think that should happen because of this. If that's difficult for you t- to hear and that would make you like want to march out of the room or quit, then that's probably not the person you want to collaborate with. You have to be open to like, I guess, compromise mm-hmm. and stopping and be like, well, well, why didn't you like my idea? Like what? I mean, that we never said that, but you know, I would say more of... than compromise is trust, right? Like yeah, it's not even compromise. like if the person, cause I never felt like, cause I, I never, yeah, I didn't feel like I was settling like, Oh, you didn't like my idea. Okay. Exactly. But I felt comfortable telling you when I wasn't okay with you liking yeah. my idea. I mean, I didn't say it like that. Okay. Like you don't like my idea. I'm not okay <laughs> with that. But I'd be like, well, but I, I didn't like settle and say, okay, we'll just always do it your way. Like you don't right. want that either. No, that's not fun. But I'm sure that that happens sometimes in collaborations. And then the other person feels a little bummed Mm -hmm. and you don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I feel like when you propose something that I couldn't quite see yet, as long as I heard like a why, like Mm -hmm. you say, we should we should add this pink here because it connects to this pink over here or whatever it was. As long as there's a why, then like game on, let's go forward. Right. I feel like you're really good at providing your reasoning behind wanting to do certain things, even if it's like a very intuitive based reasoning. Yeah. And that's so interesting because when you work alone, you make those decisions and you don't have to explain to anyone why you do them, which is fine. But it really is a good practice to whether that be writing it down, like if you are working alone, like Mm -hmm. making an Instagram post about your process. It's really interesting to kind of reflect why why do I need that to happen? It's a good creative practice. So you could talk out loud to yourself or mm-hmm. you could just have another person listening to yeah, you Yeah, get say your that. cat in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could tell your dog all these things. <laughs> Making this choice because... Well, Amanda, working on this project with you has been such a joy that... I, I was telling you this morning on the couch that if it were just me working solo on this project, I would have spent half as much time mm-hmm. and it would have been nearly as electric and vibrant and radiant as this project has come to be. So thank you. Yeah, I really, I, I'm getting a little sad. I don't want you to leave Chicago. I just really love these collaborations. And when you invited me to be a creative partner on, on this before we even had the ties, it's hard to think back to that. And I just knew that we were going to create something beautiful that would look like both of us because I know that we work really well together. I'm just grateful to have found you as someone that I could collaborate with. Because I don't, I don't think I ever thought I could really, I guess I just didn't know what it looked like to creatively collaborate on something without it being like you do a little bit I'll do a little bit you do a little bit Mm -hmm. and then okay there we go there's something I've learned so much and I can't wait for the next one I'm so grateful for you and your creative brain but likewise (laughs) and listen there's that house for rent down the street don't be surprised if like one day I just like pull up in a moving truck he's so awesome and then we could like maybe slow down a little bit and collaborate not wreck our wrists and fingers yeah these like really intense but what i did i loved about this process i loved that we both worked on it ahead of time Mm -hmm. and closed it up together 
But I, I don't know. I'm open to trying it in another format, too. With you. Oh, there's so many ways um, to collab. Yay. I hope you enjoyed this first ever documentary episode of Seamside. If you get the chance, I sure would love to hear from you. I read each and every review you leave on Apple Podcasts. I especially love hearing how Seamside has influenced your creative practice. So I'll be keeping an eye out for those reviews. And until then, take care, sow something good, and I hope I get to see you soon. Maybe around the nook. Who knows?